Hi, I'm Sharon Zhou. I want to show you this uh, little apple tree that I bench grafted eight and a half months ago. Today is December 5th, so the tree is about to lose its leaves and go dormant. And next spring, I'm going to plant this tree in the ground. Um, let's take a look at what are the different parts of this. Um, this here is the graft union. Uh, I started with the rootstock, which goes from the soil to here. And then the next segment is the little piece of scion that I grafted onto the rootstock. Um, and from this point on, all the way to the top, is what this little tree uh, grew in the last eight and a half month. So here's the junction. Uh, I used a graft called the cleft graft. You could see uh, there's a difference in the bark between the rootstock and the scion. Um, I'm going to show you how we got here. We're talking today about grafting deciduous trees during the dormant season. Um, I'm mainly gonna show you the cleft graft, and if we have time, I may also demonstrate the whip and tongue graft. Um, these techniques can also be used on evergreen trees and also on deciduous trees outside of the dormant season, just with some uh, minor modifications. So what is grafting? Grafting is a technique and art of combining two plant parts so they can grow together. Um, this sometimes occurs in nature and people have been using uh, these practices for perhaps thousands of years. So why do we want to graft? Uh, so the number one reason is you want to produce a plant with the, your desired characteristics. Uh, so for example, you could select rootstock uh, for such desired qualities, such as um, qualities of a root system, such as disease or pathogen resistance, uh, adaptability to environment, um, productivity of the tree, and how much does the root system control the size of the tree. And along with size control of the tree, uh, it can also infer precocity to the tree. What that means is it can affect how quickly your, uh, your fruit tree starts to bear fruit. Um, you would also want to select scions for desired qualities such as uh, the fruit variety, uh, which you may prefer a certain color, a certain shape, um, how the tree may look. Uh, sometimes be, ornamentally people select uh, plants for its foliage color. And, um, and then there's also chill requirement and fruit quality uh, and productivity. And those becomes really important with climate change. As our climate gets warmer in a particular region, uh, you may have some trees that has really high chill requirement uh, that are no longer pr productive or reliably productive. So you can change the variety of your existing tree to something of lower chill requirement. So, Changing variety of the existing tree is a very useful use of grafting. Um, it's also called top working. And later on, we will be showing you how to use the same grafting technique on an existing tree in the orchard. And that's typically called top working. Um, and the last use is to repair damage. So if you have a rodent that chewed all around the base of your tree, uh, usually when a tree is girded like that, it will die eventually. So you could use grafting techniques to repair that damage. We won't go into that today. So some of the considerations of grafting include um, 
First of all, you want to have compatibility of your rootstock and your scion. Uh, most typically, we use apple rootstock for apple scion. Uh, some, some species of trees can uh, use another species for, uh, as rootstock. So for example, it's possible to graft a pear onto a quince rootstock or on an existing quince tree um, that you want to top work. Um, so some important things are um, for successful grafting are, uh, number one, you need to have a very sharp and clean knife to make a really straight and clean cuts. That way, when you bring two parts of, of plants together, they make good full contact. Uh, I also really stress the sharp knife. Um, so it may seem like we're going into a lot of details um, in this part. Uh, but what I want to share with you are some of the things that I really struggled with early on when I started grafting. Uh, for example, not having a good enough knife, uh, not being able to make a straight cut and things like that. Uh, so, so you don't need to go through and repeat the same kind of struggles I went through. And um, I also want to show you some slightly more advanced techniques that also helps to improve grafting success. So um, the next important thing is you want to maximize cambial contact. So what is cambium? I want to show you what cambium is. On a, on a diagram. I want to show you just enough botany. Some of you probably already know this really, really well, but I just want to show you enough about botany to help you make a successful graft. So here's the cross section of the stem of a tree. And I'm going to show you a few layers within. Um, the dark brown layer on the outside is the bark. The bark is a protective layer. Um, just inside the, the dark brown bark is a layer called the phloem. It's also known as the inner bark. Uh, and then inside the phloem is a layer that's only one cell thick called the cambium. Uh, inside, further inside the cambium is the xylem, uh, also known as sapwood. And then further in um, is called the, the, the heartwood. So the three important things here are the phloem, the cambium, and the xylem. So the phloem and, cam, um, the, phloem and the xylem are vascular tissues. Xylem transports uh, water and mineral nutrients from the root system up the tree to eventually arrive at the leaves for photosynthesis. And the product of photosynthesis is carbohydrate. Uh, then the carbohydrate gets distributed throughout different parts of the tree. Um, that is the energy source. So it's the energy source for growth, for food. Um, so that's why these, the xylem and the phloem are extremely crucial for the growth of a tree. What cambium is, it's only one cell thick, but it's like the stem cell. It's, it's able to generate new layers of the phloem and new layers of the xylem. So 
this is the cambium is where new vascular tissue gets um, formed. So when we try to combine two plant parts, the most crucial thing is to have cambial contact, uh, which just means contact of the cambium of the two uh, plant parts. Now, since sometimes we're grafting together two plant parts that are a different caliper, and one may have a much thicker bark um, than another. And cambium is only one cell thick, so you cannot exactly see it. You can infer by its you, you could infer its presence by seeing where the phloem is, and the phloem is the green part. So So the cambium is so thin that um, you really can't see it with naked eye. The way you imagine where it is, is that it's just inside the phloem, which is green. So now I'm going to trace out the edge so to help you visualize where that is. Getting the cambial contacts is the most important thing. Um, and cam the cambium is really amazing. You don't have to line it up completely um, all the way down. If it even just crosses at some point, then that crossing will generate um, callus tissue. And then within the callus, um, You'll start, the cambium will start to make vascular connections. And it's only when the vascular connection is made that the two parts can truly grow as one plant. So after you make the graft union, um, it's also, after you make the cambium contact, it's also really crucial to apply pressure to these parts. Um, and then after that, you also, you, you wrap it up so you could prevent it from drying out, uh, which is called desiccation. And then I'm going to go over uh, aftercare of your graft. And um, also it's important to avoid transmission of plant diseases or pathogens. So um, as much as possible, if you could get science from, uh, from a known disease-free source, you would, like, you would want to do that. Uh, sometimes, if it's not possible, at least get it from somebody, uh, somebody you know, and you know that their tree is healthy and thriving. Um, okay, and be sure that, uh, be sure you only use non-patented uh, varieties when you graft. Okay, did you want to show that cover or does that come later? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. You can just hold. Okay. So, so here's a book I got from the library, uh, in this case, Berkeley Public Library. And on its cover, it just has the most perfect um, picture of a cleft graft. You see how the color of the scion and the color of the um, rootstock are different. And so you split the rootstock in half, and then you cut the scion into a wedge shape. And you push that scion into uh, the split. And so after that, you'll want to uh, wrap it type tightly. So some additional considerations are, uh, number one, you need to make sure you have healthy rootstock as well as healthy scion. Um, you need to take into consideration their suitability for the environment you're going to be growing them. Uh, timing is also really important. 
Uh, generally, most people like to do uh, grafting during the dormant season um, because it tends to be more forgiving. Um, neither of the plant parts are actively growing, so they could tolerate a little bit uh, more time, a little bit more handling. Um, but I will also show you some additional uh, modifications you could do that makes it possible for you to graft um, in the middle of summer or even as late as Halloween. Um, as long as the plant is still actively, like not growing bigger, but still actively doing photosynthesis, it is still possible to graft. Um, labeling is extremely important. As soon as I collect the scion, I put a piece of tape on it and I label the variety. And uh, when the rootstock comes, you'll know what kind of rootstock you have, uh, you have ordered or you bought. So that's a good idea to write that down too. Um, because otherwise, if you have an unknown tree, uh, it's gonna be several years before you'll see fruit to know what it is that you actually had. The other thing to know is that uh, permanent markers are not actually permanent out in the garden. So don't just rely on a permanent marker to write onto your grafting tape. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit more. There are some other options that are more permanent than a permanent marker. Uh, and I will be going into the aftercare of your grafted plants a little bit later. So why do we need a grafting knife? Can we just use these we have around the house? So these will not allow you to make a straight clean cut and I will explain why momentarily. Of course you can't use a dinner knife, it doesn't even have a blade. So here's my collection of grafting knives. They come in a few different shapes. Uh, the most common one is like this, it's, it's, it's a straight blade. And uh, it's beveled on one side as we previously discovered. So I'm turning it to the side that has a bevel. I, I drew it with a black permanent marker so you could see where the bevel is. And where's this side? It's just completely flat. So what makes grafting knives different from ordinary knives is that grafting knives are single beveled. What that means is if you're looking at the blade, uh, the grafting knife has one side of the blade that's straight. And then the other side has this bevel and, that's, and, and this is what comes to uh, the sharp edge of the blade. So an ordinary knife, whether it's a pocket knife or a kitchen knife, would have two bevels. So there are a few other shapes. That's the shape that I use all the time. That's the most common. Um, this is called a budding knife. So it, it's still a single bevel knife. So that's the flat side, this is the bevel side. But it's more rounded at the tip. And it has a little nub called a, a bark lifter. Um, if we make another video about budding, we will get into that. Um, this, this has a shorter blade, but it is still doable if that's the only knife uh, you have access to. Um, this is another version of a budding knife. So once again, uh, it's curved at the tip. 
uh, this one doesn't have a bark lifter. First, we need to clean the tools to make sure uh, no disease is introduced to the new plants we're making. So some people think if they just take a bottle of alcohol, this is uh, rubbing 70% rubbing alcohol, if they just spray it on the dirty tool, uh, that'll, sterilize, that'll sterilize the dirt. It doesn't work that way. Uh, oftentimes on your pruning shears or even on grafting knives, you have a lot of sap uh, that's dried up on the blade. Um, no matter what kind of disinfectant you spray on it, it's not going to disinfect through um, all the plant debris. So first you have to get the plant debris off. To do that, I use a piece of uh, damp paper towel I wipe it. Um, if it's sap, it might take a little time for it to soften, but water is the best cleaning uh, method for a lot of the tools. So we're getting the dirt off. And the same thing with grafting knife. You get the dirt off and I'll wipe it with a piece of dry paper towel. Because I want a dry surface before I spray, um, you could use rubbing alcohol, or you could use 10% bleach if you are having an active infection of uh, something say like fire blight. I would be really, really careful. In fact, I would not be grafting when you have fire blight going on in a garden. But that's what it takes to, uh, to clean uh, an active infection is first you have to remove debris from the blade before you could do a disinfecting. So I'm going to spray some alcohol on it and then I'm going to let that dry. I'm going to show you how I make the cut. I hold it with the flat side to me and when you make the cut uh, you want the flat side to be shade, to be facing the piece of stick that you want to keep. Um, the flat side of the blade is what allows you to make a flat cut, which then will give you the good cambio contact. Um, the bevel side, since it has a curve to it, is more likely um, for you to end up with a scooped cut instead of a straight cut. So if you're a right-handed person holding a right-handed knife, you would hold the scion here. We're talking about cutting scion wood here. You would cut the scion, you would take the scion in your left hand, hold the knife with a flat side facing yourself. And um, I am very adamant about people not directing a sharp blade at themselves. So the way that I make the cut is like this, okay? It's not with my wrist, it's not even with my elbow, because these smaller muscles, anytime you try to make a cut with it, you'll end up curving and you'll end up scooping. Um, also, I was in my late 50s uh, when I started learning to graft, and I was not very strong. So by engaging in the, large, in the larger muscles of my body, namely my deltoid, and when I pull with my shoulder like this, I have a lot more power than scooping with my, uh, my wrist. I also want to say, uh, some of the YouTube videos you're going to see on the internet 
are showing people to use a grafting knife like this, okay? Cutting towards their own thumb. <laughs> That's a really, really bad idea and it is not necessary. Uh, the method I'm showing you has a lot more power and is a whole lot safer. Uh, you want to make sure you're not swinging out because oftentimes in grafting workshops, when you're working in pro close proximity to other people, you don't want the knife to end like that. So this once again is the safest. Um, at this point in a hands-on grafting workshop, I would usually uh, give every participant a loner knife that's properly sharp and uh, give them a bucket full of sticks and have them just go cut the sticks for about 30 minutes and uh, to practice until you start to make friends with uh, your knife. And uh, at some point the knife kind of becomes an extension of your arm. If you're a left-handed person, but you only have access to a right-handed grafting knife, um, because very few manufacturers make left-handed uh, version. There is a way to cut with a right-handed knife, um, which is you basically do the same thing. You set up the angle that you plan to cut at, and then you push with that hand and pull with this hand. Actually, you push with that shoulder and pull with this shoulder. So it'll look like, and I still got a decent cut, even though I'm not left-handed. Um, show that again. Okay. Um, so I'm coming back to this book again I got from the library on page 134 it has these diagrams to show you if you're a right-handed person how you make the cut if you're a left-handed person they show you how to how to use a right-handed um, knife um, so here as you can see in this picture, I strongly recommend getting this book if, you, if you're really interested in grafting. So this is the angle the cut will be. So that's the angle that you aim your cut at. And when I want to do something, like when I want to do exactly what the book is doing, instead of looking at a face on and being opposite, I turn the book around. That way, the right will be on the right and the left will be on the left. So this is how the book is showing and that's exactly how I do it. Is you angle the knife so it's almost parallel with your um, scion, with your stick. You want this angle to be, I guess we we'll call it shallow. So you could get as long of a cut as possible. Um, generally you want to aim for about an inch and a half of cut. So for beginners, we usually don't get it quite so long, uh, but after a little bit of practice um, and a, a good and sharp enough knife, you will get it. So I first get the knife, just cut into the wood a little bit then I angle it because the more um, I angle it, the more of the straight edge is on the cutting surface. So the, 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 so having more of the straight edge of the knife guiding will allow me to make a better cut.
And once I set it up, I'm ready to cut. I don't even recommend that you look at it because if you look at it, you're going to try to micromanage and uh, it'll probably end up being crooked. Just go ahead and pull. Okay, I didn't get the bite well enough. So again, I could look straight ahead and pull. Um, you could also do this in the mirror <laughs> to make sure you're using the right part of your body. Again, since your hands, um, your fingers are not in the path of your knife, it's safe to look into the mirror to see what you're doing. And um, just think about your shoulders and pull. So now we've practiced to make one straight cut. Uh, we're going to do two straight cuts and make a wedge out of the scion. And this again requires a little practice. Um, so I'll do the first. We could aim for um, a wedge that's about one and a half inches long. Um, but if you ended up only with one inch, but still a nice uh, wedge, that could still be used. So I just made one reaching only about half of this stick. So the next one, you know, the same thing. And um, so that's not bad. I didn't exactly come to a sharp point at the end, but even that's okay. Um, because the, this never goes completely into the, the very end of the split. So we have both sides um, cut about the same place. And so we could just cut off the very end a bit. So oftentimes I don't want to have the very end come to a very sharp point anyway, because uh, when, it's when it comes to a very sharp point, there's not much uh, integrity to the structure. So sometimes I do cut the very tip off. So what you have now is something that looks like this. So you'll notice um, this side is a little bit narrower than the first side. So it's this side that's a little bit wider is the side that we're going to have, um, have its cambium cross with the um, cambium of the rootstock. So go ahead and practice a few times. It, 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 like, it takes a little time to end up with uh, two straight cuts that meet into a point like this. Now I'm going to cut the split into the rootstock. I normally do this cut first before I cut the scion because uh, the cut is not completely exposed once I finish. So I'll be able to lay it on the countertop, on the tabletop, while I cut the scion. The scion is going to be cut like this. So both cut edges are very exposed. And once you have the cut edge, you don't want to contaminate um, any cut edge. So that means no touching with your fingers. Uh, your knife should be very clean and uh, you definitely don't want to lay it down where it could get pick, uh, where it could pick up dirt. Um, if you're buying a new root stock, um, sometimes they can arrive quite muddy. So you really want to get it washed. You don't have to use soap, but uh, just get a damp paper towel to wipe it down. Uh, or even under under the uh, the tap, you want to be able to drag a wet paper towel on it and not see any dirt, 
because any dirt that gets into the graft union will affect the healing um, and uh, the forming of the union. So this would be about a typical caliper of uh, new rootstock that you buy. Um, sometimes I have rootstocks that I didn't use uh, from the previous year that's been growing in the pot and they can get to be a little tougher and sometimes the buds could get uh, to be kind of tough to be cutting through. Um, so, and also you don't want to cut through a bud on the rootstock side because you don't want a bud from the stock, the rootstock in the middle of your graft union. Uh, if something grows out of the area, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell uh, which, wh which side did this come from. So if you see, here's a bud here. So I don't want to make a cut straight through like this. What I want to do is to make a cut like that. Okay, so on this stick, for demonstration purpose, I drew a line, okay? Just to show you, I, I don't do this with an actual stock I'm going to cut. So here's the bud. You want to avoid cutting into the bud. You, you don't want to split the bud. So here's the line, and that's where I'm going to start the cut. So for splitting the stock, you could use your grafting knife to do that. But remember, a grafting knife uh, blade is asymmetrical. It's flat on one side and has a bevel on the other side. It tends to make the knife want to go towards the flat side. Uh, you can still make it work. Just be mindful of that and do it slowly and not allow the knife to go that way. Uh, alternately, you could use a regular knife that's, again, clean and uh, regular meaning a double beveled knife. So that's, that has a symmetrical blade, um, which is what I'm going to do here. Um, also, I'm going to be making a cut. I need to hold this in my hand, and I'm going to be making a cut like this. So sometimes, if there's any angle at all, the knife can, certain, can suddenly take off and cut myself. So I use a finger guard. Um, this is just a quarter inch plywood with a hole drill in the middle. It doesn't matter if its overall shape is round or square. You could also use a CD that you're ready to discard. Just put the hole uh, put the stick through the hole to protect your hand. So here I go, following this line. Again, this line is for demonstration purpose. And I'm, um, I could either rock the knife, again, getting my finger out of the way, or I could rock the stock. Doesn't matter and I keep the finger guard fairly close to the blade so the blade can never take off and travel very far. Okay, so another safety point. If you're using your grafting knife, and most grafting knives are folding knives, when you pull this out, be very careful uh, because the knife can snap back on you and I've cut myself that way. So be careful when you uh, pull a grafting knife out of the split. So here we have the split and the bud is here. Now we're going to put the two parts together. So this is split. This has a nice wedge cut. It's slightly thicker on that side than it is in the back. And 
it's also slightly longer on that side. Like I said earlier, you could, um, once you get it to a point, you could use your pruner to trim it just a little bit. It's the th slightly thicker and longer side that we're going to match the cambium. So you jam it in there. So uh, some advanced techniques. Uh, I'll share one with you right now. Um, so in this case, you could see that the stock is thicker than the scion. And uh, we don't know exactly how thick the, um, the cambium, no, how thick the phloem is on either the stock or the scion. Remember, cambium is just inside of the phloem. So um, we could guess, um, and usually the, um, the scion, which has a smaller diameter, tends to have um, a thinner bark. So instead of lining up the outside, which you may end up having the two cambio layers parallel and not actually meeting. So if we put the cambium layers parallel, they may not cross. And remember, it's the contact that's required uh, for the graft union to start healing. So uh, therefore, we cross it. And that way, we know at least there is one point of contact. And to demonstrate that point, I'm just going to exaggerate it. OK, so here I pushed the scion askew. And uh, this way, I know for sure there is very good contact. Then I'm going to bring it back a little and show you just like how I would have it before wrapping. But even with this exaggeration, as long as the scion is not sticking out this end, I could wrap it up like this and it will be a successful graft. If it sticks out here, I would just take a knife and very gently cut away that extra piece sticking out. That way, when I wrap it, uh, when I wrap it tight, um, that extra piece sticking out is not going to cause the alignment to be thrown off again. Now we're going to do the real thing. So here's a rootstock. It's a variety called Geneva, Geneva 969. So the Geneva series of rootstock um, are more recently developed and they have some extra disease um, resistant properties. So for example, this one, particular one, is tolerant of apple replant disease and um, I believe is resistant to woolly apple aphid and uh, also phytophthora. So it would be suitable for uh, wet conditions. Um, this one, I bought this in um, January of 2022 and I didn't graft it. So it's been growing um, in this pot for almost a year. Uh, of course, you can see it's now dormant. Um, the, uh, it was small when I got it, so right now it's about the same caliper as if I were to buy a new rootstock. So um, I usually like to graft it at about six to eight inches. Um, the reason being, from my past experience, when I dig a hole and plant the plant, uh, Sometimes they sink, and I definitely want the graft union to be above the above the ground. Uh, Geneva 
969 is a fairly dwarfing rootstock. I think you'll end up with um, a plant, a tree, maybe about 50-60% of a, a standard tree. So um, I'm going to first make the cut. Like I said earlier, I usually prepare the rootstock first. And then um, I have the scion here ready and it was uh, labeled when I collected it and um, I collected earlier today. If I had collected earlier, uh, like much earlier, say three weeks ago, what I would need to do is put this in a Ziploc bag and then uh, just give it one single spray of water and then close the bag tightly and then put it in the refrigerator. So since this is dormant, uh, it can stay in the refrigerator for um, up to six months. So I have grafted uh, scions that I collected while dormant and uh, grafted them as late as September and they still took and grew out. Okay, so I'm going to so as we were talking about earlier, we want to not cut through the bud um, or a branch of the rootstock. So I'm choosing, so this is the one that I want to not cut into. So I'm going to make the cut just below the other, uh, the other bud, which is here. So you could see that the bud is here. So the direction of a cut I want to make would be like this. If you bought new rootstock that arrived as bare root and you um, grafted immediately, you could wait until after you do the graft to, um, to put it in the pot. Um, it, it makes just a little easier to maneuver, but um, it's also doable. Um, like this in, in, in a pot. And by the way, this basket is not necessary. It's just a prop to make sure my rootstock doesn't flop over. So, exactly halfway, excuse me. I need to see better. So here again is the hand protector. And I angle it so I would not be cutting through the bud. And I would gently rock. I also like to put a finger on top so if the knife does suddenly take off, my finger would um, stop it from. That sometimes happens. So my finger did stop it and also the uh, protector did stop the knife from running into my hand. So here it is ready. And like I said, I prepare the rootstock first, then I come work on the scion. Um, with the scion, I'm, also, I'm only going to need like two or three buds. Uh, however, since I'm not a perfect grafter yet, um, I leave it long and work with it because I may need to make the to make multiple attempts at this cut until I like I like it perfectly. <laughs> so the same technique that we talked about earlier. Okay, so the first cut is pretty straight and it's got good length to it. So now I attempt my second cut. This is a pretty good cut. So because at the very tip when it's really, really thin, it doesn't have much structural integrity, I'm just going to trim a little bit of that off. If I rotate it very slowly, you could see that the front side, the side that has a bud on, 
um, is wider, just a tiny little bit wider than the back side. And this is about an inch and a quarter, and that's okay. Um, you could see that the scion and the stock are almost exactly the same diameter. So I take and remember to clean your knife before uh, you start cutting into either parts of this. And remember, do not cut, um, do not touch the cut surface. I'm going to rotate it because I'm right-handed and it tends to be easier for me to work with this direction. So earlier we talked about um, angling the scion a little bit to uh, make sure we have um, cambium crossing. And here's another uh, advanced technique that is, um, it's not a bad idea to tuck a um, partially cut bud into the graft union because buds usually contain uh, more carbohydrates. So it's more nutrients to the graft union as it's healing. And also, because um, each bud pokes out a little bit, so the scion in, in the bud actually makes a slight curve out this way and then go back in. So we are potentially increasing the number of crossing. Um, so we have a crossing here. We have a crossing there. I'm just going to push the top in a little bit more. Okay. And then in this case, on the back side, we also have two crossings. Uh, and we only match one side. So this other side is not matched. And I see that the scion is sticking out a little. I'm just going to cut that off. So as I wrap it, um, it's not going to push the um, scion off its position. So I take about 18 inches of this vinyl grafting tape. This is the kind of tape I tend to like to use, but I'm going to talk about some other options. And I will want to stop us to start below uh, the lowest part of the split. This tape um, stretches. It doesn't stick to itself, it just stretches. So I could give it a little bit of tension. Remember, uh, pressure is also an important part of uh, success to your graft. You want flat cuts, you want perfect uh, cambio match and a uh, flat surface, and then you want to apply pressure. So the pressure is usually applied with uh, your grafting tape. So during our um, simulated demo earlier, I was able to rotate the whole assembly and that's the same case if you have bare root um, rootstock, but it's okay. I just need to, to hold on while maintaining the tension. If I have some way of holding the pot steady, it will make it a lot easier. As, as you see, this is spinning on me a little bit. But it's not the end of the world. <laughs> So I'm maintaining the tension as I wrap, and you want 
the um, tape to overlap, say by about half or 30%, uh, roughly. And here again, we have church windows. And um, so sometimes I just, if I have extra tape, I come back down a little bit to make sure I have plenty of tension. Let's see, maybe you could see a little better like this. You'll pull this tight. Okay, so we'll label it in a moment. So typically we want to leave two or three buds to grow. So one, two, three, you don't want to leave the whole thing because you want the plant to actually focus its energy on just a couple of buds to begin with. And then uh, once it's grown, like maybe about 12 inches, you actually want to select the strongest bud, the most vigorous bud, the bud with the most vigorous growth. And then you want to suppress the others. So you have just one single growth um, that's going to, over the course of the next growing season, uh, grow into the whip, um, three foot, five foot tall, so you could plant it during the next dormant season. So leaving two or three buds, cut off the rest because we want the plant to focus its growth energy um, into just a few buds initially. And then once they've grown, say about six to 12 inches, you actually want to just choose the strongest one and then suppress the rest. Suppressing the rest may mean uh, putting a closed pin on it so it becomes horizontal or you could remove it. So this is the first part of the wrap. And um, we want to close the top off. This time of the year, meaning dormant season, um, you could just use a little piece of masking tape without taping up the bud. Um, other times of the year when you want to protect the plant more against desiccation. So I have this material called buddy tape. Uh, alternately, parafilm is a similar kind of material. Um, if you're grafting during the warmer season, uh, this, is, this will protect against drying out but it's still breathable. And this particular material will allow the buds uh, as it leaves out to break through. So all it takes is this one little piece. Um, I stretch the end a little bit. I want to cover the end of that other grafting tape. and then wrapping and stretching. This thing sticks to a cell, but it doesn't stick to other things. It's, it's a really, really nice material to use. You could overlap a little bit, but don't wrap too many layers. So like, again, I'm overlapping about 30%. There it is. So the next thing, very important, is to label. So you know what you have. Um, on this particular kind of uh, vinyl grafting tape, uh, you, I could either use, this is called a permanent garden marker, excuse me. 
a regular permanent marker is not permanent. It'll fade and within a couple of months, you won't know what you have anymore. What would be better is for me to just take another piece of tape where I could write it nicely, tie it on. Another uh, kind of pen that's fairly permanent on plastic is a China marker, which is essentially a, a crayon. Um, it'll last a long, long time on this. So I'm gonna tie that up and then I'm going to show you some alternate taping method and uh, then talk to you about aftercare. A couple of different kinds of wrapping you could use. Um, one is a material called um, um, parafilm. This is used in labs to cover uh, petri dishes and things like that. So I'm going to simulate it. This is one of the uh, simulation we did earlier. So this again stretches. So I don't feel that uh, this tension is enough and sometimes it breaks. You just start again overlapping Okay, twist the end off. And then you grab one of these, um, it's called grafting rubber. Really, it's a, it's a flat rubber band. So, so again, remember, we need to apply a lot of tension. Uh, this stretchy material doesn't allow, the, the uh, parafilm doesn't allow enough tension. That's why I like to use that vinyl grafting tape. But this rubber band, will provide the tension. So, and this rubber band does not need to overlap. And then I come back down. Again, put the rubber through a loop. So this is another way of doing it. And um, so if you just want to try your hand at grafting and you don't have any of this specialty material, don't worry, masking tape will work too. And I'll show you how I would go about doing that. Masking tape works especially for this time of the year because uh, both parts are dormant, temperature is not very high. So you don't have to worry about desiccation as much. So again, you want to apply tension to your graft union. So masking tape will stick to itself. Applying tension. And sometimes it breaks, just grab another piece and continue. Okay, I came a little bit short. So I want to cut all the co uh, cover all the cut surface. So the cut surface is now covered. I'll grab another piece and make a kind of a skirt. So let it puff out. So this, this acts as a, like a raincoat. And then at the tip, so the cut edge is the edge that's, uh, that we have to protect against desiccation uh, during the winter, early spring.
just pinch the top. So this will do fine for dormancies and grafting um, because there is very little, uh, very little heat, so don't have to worry about drying out. Whereas um, if you graft, if you do this graft, say in January and um, apple isn't going to leaf out until April, you might just want to use a little bit extra protection against um, drying out like um, the buddy tape or the parafilm. Uh, so this will work. You could, you could graft um, into late spring just using this method. Uh, I've done this during the summer also. You have to harvest your scion uh, fresh, but, but this is also doable. This, uh, so make sure this is watered, but you don't want to water it too much. You don't want the, the, the rootstock to rot out because um, right now the plant is not using a whole lot of water. Let me tell you some about the aftercare. So you keep it out of direct sunlight. Um, or if you know that the weather is not very warm yet, you could do 50% sunlight. Um, oftentimes the rootstock is going to shoot out before the scion um, starts to leaf out. So you want to just allow the rootstock um, shoots to grow somewhat, but don't let it get out of hand. So you pinch it back a little bit or you put a close pin on it and just make it horizontal so it doesn't have that vigor. And once these, uh, once the scion starts to leaf out, then you could slowly pinch away uh, some of the rootstock suckers. Um, and once it leaves out, you want to water and feed it generously. So once it leaves out, um, you could either directly plant your rootstock in a five gallon container, or in this case, um, since it's already in this pot, I'm going to wait until it leaves out to uh, transplant into a five gallon container. A five gallon container is how much soil this plant is going to require in order to uh, grow to three feet, five feet, growing into a whip that you plant, uh, you could plant next winter. Once the buds of the graft come out, you choose the strongest one. So let it grow a few inches and you'll be able to tell which one has the most uh, vigor. Choose that and then suppress the rest. And if for some reason the graft doesn't take, um, you could cut back to just beyond the graft union. And another reason why I like to have like six to eight inches here is I get to have a second chance if for some reason uh, this doesn't take. So that's about it for the aftercare. Remember, it needs a five gallon container to properly grow into a healthy tree and uh, water and fertilize it generously once it leaves out.